The Unforgivable Sin. What is it exactly, and how is it committed? Stay with us. Renewing Your Mind with R.C. Sproul is next. The Bible tells us that to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is the one sin that God will not pardon. And that strikes fear in many Christians. In fact, you may have wondered if you've committed this sin and lost your salvation. We're about to hear, though, that God will never allow His people to sin in this way. Here's Dr. Sproul as he preaches from the Gospel of Mark. Well, first of all, we read here in Mark that Jesus' own friends accuse Him of being mad. But the more serious accusation comes in the following passages coming from the authorities. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Now, this, beloved, is the most vicious charge up to this point and perhaps in his whole life that has ever leveled against Jesus. The first accusation of this, he is with Beelzebub. And who is Beelzebub? In antiquity, Beelzebub was seen as a demigod, a lesser deity who ruled over filth, carrion, and flies. He was called the Lord of the Dunghill. You've known a popular piece in American literature entitled Lord of the Flies, which is a takeoff on this title, Beelzebub. Now, some of the manuscripts indicate that the word that is used by the scribes is not Beelzebub, but Beelzebul, which refers not so much to this particular demonic one who reigns over flies and carry on and dung heaps, but rather the God of the Baals, who is considered the Lord of all the demonic realm, which would be a title for Satan himself. And so that you hear what the scribes are saying. They're saying, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. The charge is this, Jesus, you're in league with the devil. We don't challenge the reality of your power. We grant that you're performing miracles, that you're healing the sick, that you're casting out demons. We're not questioning the facts here, but we're asking this question, by what power are you able to do these marvelous works? And the conclusion the scribes came to was that Christ was working through the power of Satan. First thing I want to say, just as an aside, is contrary to the widespread view that pervades the evangelical Christian world today, Satan, I don't believe, ever has performed a bona fide miracle. Satan does not have divine power. Satan is a creature, and he may be stronger than we are, but he can't do the things that only God can do. His works are called in Scripture, lying signs and wonders. That is, their counterfeits, their frauds. But notice that the scribes here are not saying that Jesus' miracles are counterfeit. They're granting that they're real, and the first mistake they make is assuming that Satan can do such things. But far more serious than their theological error at this point is the charge and accusation that the power by which Jesus works is the power of Satan. Now, if we've been watching closely the unfolding of this gospel record of the life and work of Christ given to us by St. Mark, we recall that at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, He was anointed and endowed for this ministry by the power, not of Satan, but of the Holy Ghost. And that the biblical portrait of Christ is that that power by which He 
casts out demons, that power by which He heals these people who are afflicted with various disease is by the power of the Holy Ghost. But His enemies are saying, no, it's not the power of God. It's the power of the devil. And you are with the devil. You're with Beelzebub. Well, notice how Jesus responds to this charge. First of all, we read, He called them to Himself, and He spoke to them in parables. He raises a question, how can Satan cast out Satan? Come on, scribes, you guys aren't thinking. You know the oldest stratagem that military leaders use? Divide and conquer. Satan's no fool. He's not going to give me power to cast out his own minions, to defeat his own army. That doesn't make any sense at all. And so, he first rebukes them for the foolishness of their thinking. He said, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Whether it's the kingdom of Alexander the Great, the kingdom of Caesar Augustus, or the kingdom of hell. If that kingdom is divided, it cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. Then he tacks on another mini parable here when he says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder the house. We think of a burglar who breaks into a home and that the owner of the home is one who is massively strong, far more strong than the thief that breaks in The thief knows if he's going to accomplish the objective of cleaning out the possessions of the strong man, he first has to subdue the strong man. He has to render him ineffective. He has to point a gun at him, get him so that he can bind his wrists and his feet, make them incapable of interrupting the theft that is going on. And Jesus, of course, is alluding here to His own ministry where Christ has broken into the very domain of Satan, and He has bound him, rendering him impotent against Jesus' power. Why am I casting out demons? Because I'm binding the strong man so that I can make ruin of his house and his dominion. Now, that's Jesus' defense of this ridiculous charge that he is in league with Satan. But what is most significant for us, I think, this morning is this sober, severe warning that he issues to those who are making this charge. Before we get to that, I want to say to you, I don't know how many times in my teaching career I've had Christians, very distraught, coming to me and asking me, first of all, what is the unpardonable sin? And second of all, with more pathos, they ask the question, is it possible that I have actually committed this unpardonable sin? That has troubled many, many people's consciences, and I suspect that if our congregation is at all typical of Christian people, that there are some, if not many of you, who at some point in your life have asked that question yourself, have I committed a sin so heinous, so serious, that it is unforgivable? Attempts to define the nature of the so-called unforgivable sin, many theories have been set forth throughout church history. Some people have argued that the unpardonable sin is murder. Others have argued that the unpardonable sin is adultery. 
because they see the serious consequences that those two sins wreak upon the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage. But I think I can speak with full assurance that neither of those sins are unpardonable for two reasons at least, the first of which is we have seen in sacred Scripture itself those who have committed those sins and have been forgiven. Exhibit A being David in the Old Testament who was guilty both of adultery and murder, and yet after his confession and repentance was restored fully to his state of grace. But even more important than the biblical examples is that when Jesus defines here the unforgivable sin, He doesn't say anything about murder or adultery. He gives specific content to define what sin is unpardonable. So let's see what He says. Assuredly, now again, he begins this statement in a radical way. I've mentioned this kind of thing before, where normally if you agree with anything I say on Sunday morning, what could be your response if you wanted to respond verbally and audibly to some truth that I declare? What would you say? Say it again. I don't hear that very often in this church. I think maybe we're a group of God's frozen chosen. (laughs) But when the congregation says amen, what that expression means is it is true. It comes from the Aramaic and the Hebrew term amuth, amen, which means truth, or it is true. And I've mentioned to you before that Jesus does something that is quite unusual, and that is He doesn't give His teaching and then wait for His apostles and disciples to say amen, but He prefaces His teaching with this word, and that's the word He uses here. He says, amen, I'm saying to you. That's like, now hear this. There's great emphasis being underlined here in this announcement. And he says, assuredly, or amen, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said, he has an unclean spirit. So, first of all, we have to understand that the New Testament in this case here and also the way in which this circumstance is repeated in Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel, we see that the unpardonable sin, that sin which will not be forgiven in this world or in the world to come, is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I think that much is absolutely clear, that the unforgivable sin is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And you say, oh, thanks a lot, preacher. I still don't know what I have to worry about because my next question is, what constitutes blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? And you may scratch your head and say, I I don't understand this. How could it be that you can blaspheme against the Father and be forgiven? You can blaspheme against the Son and be forgiven, but if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, you're toast. (laughs) This, This doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. In fact, if you look at the report of this discussion in Luke's gospel and in Matthew's gospel, you have Jesus giving this qualifier that even adds more difficulty to the subject. He said, any sin against the Son of Man can be forgiven. And we know that he regards himself as the Son of Man. He says, you can blaspheme me, and presumably the Father, but don't even think about blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. The first thing you have to understand if we're going to unpack the meaning of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to understand the warning comes in the context that we have just examined. That Jesus gives this warning when His opponents are charging Him 
with doing his work in the power of the devil, of accusing Jesus of being in league with Satan, rather than performing his work in the power of the Holy Ghost. And yet, the statements they're making are directed against Jesus. And he said, now you blaspheme me. You can be forgiven. But be careful, boys. You're coming perilously close to the unforgivable sin. You're right at the line. You're looking down into the abyss of hell. One more step, and there will be no hope for you. Now, notice the difference between this warning here and Jesus' statement from the cross. When He looks at those who have delivered Him into the hands of the Romans, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, those who were there, He looks out against this group who have blasphemed Him, have mocked Him, and what does He say? Father, forgive them. Here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, Father, forgive them because they know perfectly well what they're doing here. No, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. So even at the point of opposing Christ to execute him, there was still hope of forgiveness. In the book of Acts, in the apostolic sermons, the early chapter, it is said, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So at least on two occasions after this discussion Jesus has with His opponents, the New Testament makes it clear that forgiveness could be had for those who despised Christ so much that they killed Him, and verifies Jesus' statement here when He says, any sins against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but not if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Now, we're still left with two questions. Well, again, why the Holy Ghost is singled out, and what is this particular blasphemy? Well, again, we start with the question of blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is not unbelief. Blasphemy is not murder. Blasphemy is not adultery. Blasphemy is a verbal sin. It's a sin you commit with your mouth or with your pen. It is an action by which you desecrate the holy character of God. If you use the name of God in vain, if you as casually in the common parlance of American people, if you walk out the door and you see something happen, you say, oh my God, you've just blasphemed. You need to understand that and not take your cue from the culture that uses the name of God in a flippant manner all the time. Don't do it, ever. Rather be found dead than to desecrate the sacred name of God. Remember the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. And so when you use the name of God in an unholy fashion, you're committing blasphemy. And you can breathe a deep sigh of relief that the unpardonable sin is not just any kind of blasphemy, because if it were any kind of blasphemy, no one of us in this room would have any hope of ever escaping the damnation of hell, because every one of us has at some point, and in many times routinely, blasphemed the name of God. But again, blasphemy is verbal. Most of the time, it's with the mouth. Some of the time, it's with the pen. But why only against the Holy Spirit? That remains the real conundrum here, doesn't it? 
where Jesus said, you can blaspheme the Father, you can blaspheme me, but don't you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, because if you do that, there is no forgiveness. It's a sin with eternal consequences. I'm trying to understand that. I think we have to look carefully at the broader context of the New Testament and the warnings that follow after the resurrection, where in Hebrews 10 particularly, let me just briefly read verse 26 and following of the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Listen carefully. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation that will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Or how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy of those who have trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood by which He was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Now notice in this warning in the epistle to the Hebrews, there is no distinction between sinning against Christ and committing that insult of the Holy Ghost. That that separation that was true before cross and resurrection disappears later. And the key I think we find here in Hebrews is that if you, after that, you have come to a knowledge of the truth. After the Holy Ghost has made it clear to you who Jesus is, then knowing that He does His work at the behest of the Father and through the power of the Spirit, if you then say that Jesus is the devil, that is, when you know perfectly well that He's not the devil. If you say it then, then you've committed the unforgivable sin. Now, again, this is not a warning against people who come to faith in Christ and then go through the dark night of the soul and have doubts assail them. It's one thing to struggle with doubt after coming to faith. It's another thing after really coming to a true regeneration and illumination of the mind, and then knowing full well who Jesus is, you say He's Satan, then you're done. I think that's what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. The bad news is this. Everybody in this room who is a Christian, humanly speaking, is capable of committing the unforgivable sin. That's the bad news. The good news is the Lord of glory who has saved you and sealed you in the Holy Ghost will never, ever, ever, ever let you commit that sin. I don't believe that any Christian in the history of the church has ever committed that sin. And even if you're sitting there saying, I'm not sure I am a Christian, and I think maybe I have committed this sin, and you're worried about it, that's one of the clearest evidences you can have that you haven't done it. Because I think the only ones who commit this sin are the demons themselves who come straight from hell. They know the identity of Christ. They know He's anointed by the Holy Ghost and is not in league with the devil. But at this point, the scribes who are accusing Jesus of being in league with the devil are themselves in league with the devil. And Jesus said, this far and no further. Thanks be to God that that sin which is unpardonable is not a sin He allows His people to commit. And uh, what a comfort it is to know that, that God not only saves us, but keeps us and keeps us even from committing the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us for the Sunday edition of Renewing Your Mind. I'm Lee Webb. 
You know, it's not uncommon for Christians to wonder if we're really saved. If you're struggling with that question, first, we encourage you to reach out to your pastor or an elder in your church. If you're not a member of a church, may I humbly suggest that could very well be a factor in the doubts you're experiencing? That's why we here at Ligonier Ministries believe that finding a Bible-believing church where the Word of God is faithfully preached is a priority. Additionally, though, a resource to help encourage you in your Christian walk is Dr. Sproul's expositional commentary on the Gospel of Mark. It's based on sermons R.C. preached while serving as co-pastor of St. Andrew's Chapel here in Sanford, Florida. Throughout the book, Dr. Sproul reveals the riches of Mark's Gospel, all while providing practical pastoral insights like we heard today. We're making this commentary available to you for your gift of any amount, and you can make your request at renewingyourmind.org. Well, next week, we'll be considering the parable of the sower, and we hope you'll join us next Sunday as we continue our study of Mark's gospel here on Renewing Your Mind. Awesome.